to AWSP in our first episode of AWSP Live TV. I'm here with Caprice Hollins today, Dr. Dr. Hollins from Cultures Connecting, and uh, Jack Aaron from the Tumwater School District uh, with Teaching and Learning, a uh, former rock star principal uh, in the Tumwater School District. So we're really excited about the opportunity to, to engage in a series um, over the next few months um, and beyond to talk about uh, going deeper and leading conversations about race and bias and, and how those impact our leadership. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's work that AWSP has tackled um, when we talk about our, our goal areas in, as an association. Um, our number one area is, is around equity, and that's a priority for us. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time um, in-house really diving into these conversations about what are our own biases and, and how do those impact us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've started to push that work out in, into the field across the state. And, you know, you, you go to any school district uh, statewide and you're going to find uh, things in mission statements that revolve around preparing kids to be global citizens. Right. Right. But, you know, unless we're willing to have a conversation about what that really means yeah. that gets beyond academics, gets beyond the social emotional learning and starts to really peel into some of the layers around, you know, race and, and conversations about bias and and how those filters impact mm -hmm. us. Right. Um, we are we are preparing those kids. Absolutely. And then how do we how do we get to closing the opportunity gap? How do we teach all students in a way that is preparing them to live in a very diverse world if we're not addressing diversity uh, uh, in the classroom, the diversity of, of what our country looks like? How do we teach them if we're omitting an important part of who those students are in the classroom? And who they're going to become and who they're going to be working with. Like, how do we really educate kids if we're not talking about who we are as a people? And I think sometimes right. people just, I think sometimes educators, and it's not, this is not just an issue within education, but people have a focus, a task, um, something that they're trying to do. Let's teach children math, but we forget that these children that we're teaching, these young people that we're teaching come with cultures. They come with experiences. They come with communication styles and values and beliefs that are not like our own. And so we can't teach them the math if we don't understand who they are and how they might even learn differently because of those cultures. So we're missing this important piece, um, which is really who are those students in order to get to the very thing that I think educators want more than anything, which is to have that successful experience of their child, under, their student understanding math or language arts or, you know, the sciences. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting because I think about, you know, my time in a classroom, my time as a leader right. um, in a building, and I don't know that I was prepared to lead those conversations. Mm. I mean, they're so critical. And, and as I've learned more just, you know, in the last five or six years and really started to, to think and pay more attention to it, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know that I had those skills. And so I would shy away from those yeah. conversations. Right, right. Um, Are yeah. you able to reflect on, like, thinking about had you have known, like, how much better of a teacher you would have been or a better educator as a result? Is that... Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I think I was a pretty good teacher in the classroom, mm -hmm. but to be an excellent teacher, you have to be able to touch on these subjects. You have to be able to go places that you might have been raised or things you don't talk about or things we don't do. Right, right. Um, you know, to really understand our kids mm -hmm. um, is such a critical piece to ensuring that they're being successful. Yeah, right. I want to I want to give you a chance to speak, Jack. But you know these things get me so excited. <laughs> so I one of the things I, I think about as I hear you speak. I, I'm not an educator. Well, I am in, in graduate school level educator, but my my field is in the is is in the profession of psychology, right? And so this idea of how can I effectively help my client if let's say they come in and they're struggling with their marriage or they're dealing with depression or anxiety. And I don't take into consideration how their sexual orientation, their race, their religion, their, their ability uh, plays a role in how they see that experience 
how they interpret it, how it adds to their experiences. So it would be like me trying to help my client and pretending like their being in a wheelchair doesn't impact their reality because I'm too uncomfortable talking about it because I'm an able-bodied person. How could I talk with a a gay client um, about their relationships and not have conversation about what it means to be a gay man in this country or, you know, to be transgender. It's like we're missing an important part of a person's identity that shapes so much uh, of their worldview and helping educators understand that even when they're talking to that parent who may be different from them, that that parent is bringing something else with them in that conversation. And so you may say that you don't notice race. You may say that you don't notice differences, but that differences, those, those differences are very much an important part of that person's life. And so how do we help educators to begin to see through that lens that that family or that child is bringing into the room? That That's really important. And I think as we're all looking to do that, this lies heavily on the principal's shoulders. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think as we are saying, how do we help educators do this, You know, all of those things, a lot of our educators that don't know how to do that are looking towards their principal. Yeah. Absolutely. And the principal may not know how to do that either. Right. But it is it is hard to not find uh, an, a, a conference anywhere in our state or nation that isn't talking about equity. Right. Right? And so right. as building leaders, it's really important that we are acknowledging the fact that we may not know yeah. and that we've got to get started on this at some level. Right, right. Because right, right. it's, tr- it's tough not to know. No one doesn't like that or to be uncomfortable right. or really not right. to know all the intricacies. This is very complex. Right. We call that the conscious incompetent stage. Like, <laughs> right. that's, that's the sucky place, right? I know that I don't know. I just don't know what to do. Right. And not only is there, you know, there, there are conferences, but there are books you can pick up. You can watch a podcast, listen to a podcast podcast. You can watch a video. There are movies and documentaries out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I grew up in the era of encyclopedias. Right. We have everything at our fingertips now. There are so many ways in which learning is possible. We don't have to wait until, uh, you know, some uh, something is developed for us. Uh, training is given to us. In fact, we shouldn't wait, even if those opportunities are brought to us. We need to be doing things in between, t- in, in between time and in the meantime uh, in right. our learning. And I think sometimes that is hard to get started. Yeah. And yes, oh, yeah. we all do know that we should be doing this work. And I, I do believe in the, the business of a school mm-hmm. or, or a school district, it's, it, it is reliant on the building mm-hmm. leader to say, we're all busy, but this is the work we're going to start. Yeah. Right. We, we have to start this. And it's not it's not easy work. No. We know that. But I, I do think that um, it's really important to to support the building leader and the people that may have to be talking about yeah. this in front of uh, their staff when they may feel uncomfortable themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a, a really large body of work that says that, you know, classroom teachers have the number one impact on student learning. And right behind that is the principal. Yes. Um, and... and you know, my wife's an instructional coach, and we have conversations at our at our house about how do things get traction in buildings. Mm-hmm. Well, they get traction in buildings when teachers believe it, but principals um, prioritize it mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and remove barriers and provide resources to make that happen. Right. Yes. Right. So you know that's why I believe that as as an association, it really is kind of our moral imperative to engage in this work. Right, right. Because if principals aren't bringing it back to the building, what you're left with is pockets of teachers. Absolutely. To decide that that's important um, or to be courageous in those mm-hmm. conversations and to go down that road. Right, right. Um, but but I, you know, I appreciate what you said about, you know, they might be uncomfortable and we might not have the tools, but it's, it's our job to find that starting place, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, a, a book that, and, and I'm sure we'll circle around to it, but, you know, a book that we've used quite a bit um, with principals in our state is Blind Spot. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'll tell you that from my personal experience between conversations I've had with you, um, both in kind of workshop settings, but, you know, personally, mm-hmm. and the Blind Spot book, those were two pretty pivotal things um, for me in terms of my understanding. Mm-hmm. And once you're able to, I think, 
to start unraveling mm -hmm. why it is that you're uncomfortable and why it is that you don't go down that road. Yeah. You start to go down that road. Right. Yes. Right. So, right. Yeah. Well, you're talking about with the with the um, classroom that um, versus what happens in a classroom. So you can have exemplary teachers. I was at, uh, in Seattle Public Schools for a number of years, and I could walk into a classroom and think, "Oh, I want that teacher to be right. my child's teacher someday." Yes. Right. And then there's this. So that's the individual versus the role that a principal can play in shifting the culture of a building and then we talk about at a district level yes. what a district can do to infuse really multicultural content the um, diversity um, uh, a really a kind of a way of being and operating as a district that uh, central office can support that because principals need that support and I'd love to engage y'all in, in this conversation around what are some of the fears yeah. because I do think it's the fears that get in the way and those fears are valid fears yeah. right I'm, I still get people don't think I get scared in this work but I do I get scared. <laughs> you know it's like everybody's looking to me to have the answers and like I can say I'm not an expert but I still want to be the expert because everybody wants me right, to be right, right? but and, I'm not and I think principals feel the same way yeah. you know they are they are looked at often to say well tell us what to do yeah, yeah, tell yeah. us how to do it yeah, and yeah. and help us on this journey mm -hmm. And so the principal, in this case, for some of us across the state, they may be going, huh, who do I turn to mm -hmm. in, in this work? I might be great at reading instruction or all of those. I might have right, my right, uh, right. the lane I travel in often as a curriculum leader or whatever right. that might be. But this yeah. might be that fear. Right. It might be those things where principals go, hmm. I need to rely on AWSP. I need to rely yeah. on my district to collectively do this work together so we are making the biggest impact that we can. Yeah. And I love that you use the word journey mm -hmm. because it's it's that, mm -hmm. right? It's not the um, build a list, check a list, draw a map, and we get to the, you know, we go from point A to point B. <laughs> but we that. wish it was. I but want it. it I want it to be. <laughs> be there by now, right? You, I always you say, open the plan and you right, go right through it and right. at the end we've learned it. But right. it isn't that. No. It's, um, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's never going to be over. Mm -hmm. You know, human nature is that um, we're always going to have bias. Race is always something that um, that's a construct that exists, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So as long as as long as those are factors in our society, and they always will be, yeah. the the refining how we navigate our world will always be part of what we're doing, right? right? That's right. the and that I think, Ron, is the fear for 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 most building leaders is that it's not a box to check mm -hmm. because then we can say we've done that, right? And so we all kind of want things to be wrapped up or right. great, we've had that training now, go do the work, right. and and that's not what this is. Right. It's right. just not. And so as people start to realize that, um, then we start to really kind of settle into the fact that we're in this, right. like you said, to create the new way mm -hmm. our district will be. Mm -hmm. We call it our new normal. What mm -hmm. is our new normal in our district? And, and how are we going to let this be um, our decisions and our discussions around race and equity be in every single thing we do? Right. Th that's not easy work. No. You know, it's funny, Kurt Hatch in our office joined us a couple of years ago and exciting and I and I had a chance to work with Kurt professionally in, in North Thurston that we school district that we both came out of and um, he and I had multiple conversations early on uh, you know and diversity and equity is a is a big part of Kurt's mm -hmm. work and we had multiple conversations early on about are you going to build those modules for principals mm -hmm. you know where where's the lesson plan mm -hmm. yep. that I can take back into my building because principals would kill for something like that to say here's the roadmap to getting right. it done and Kurt, Kurt would always have to say, hey, slow down. That's not how <laughs> right, this works. Right. Right. That's what Capri told me. <laughs> slow <laughs> down. Right? Slow right. down. It's, um, it's, it, it, there is no roadmap. <laughs> right. There's no module A, right. B, and C, and now right. we're done right. with it. Right, right, right. right. Um, but there are strategies and things that we can talk about. And, and tools do. to right. guide us. And mm -hmm. I, I love, one of the things that uh, Kurt said that I love is the idea that the process is the product, right? Yeah. And I always tell people, Oprah Winfrey would bring back her show and put me on it if I had the answers, right? Like everybody <laughs> is seeking the answers. And what's exciting to me is that we have an opportunity 
this is a great time in our country to um, engage in a way that we never have before, not really, in authentic, meaningful ways and shape a new way of being as a culture. Right? Mm -hmm. Like we get to like we get to make some change. In the 60s, it was it a lot of it was our work to change laws. Yeah. Right? A lot of it was, I mean we still have laws that need to be changed, but a lot of that was, you know, we deserve the right to vote. Mm -hmm. We deserve it is it should be every person's human right to be able to sit at the same counters. Mm -hmm. Now it's about how do I show up in relationship with you? Yeah. Not that laws don't need to be changed, but how can I be more open to your experiences as someone in a wheelchair? What don't I know or understand so that when I'm thinking about this idea of wanting to create a welcoming and inclusive space, that I'm doing the work to try to be a part of what that means to create that space for you, that I don't work, wait for Kurt to come in as someone who's leading diversity work. He can help to guide the mm -hmm. districts, mm -hmm. you know, in your um, in this state. But that there's a personal commitment that people have to what they want for their students right. and for the staff. By the way, absolutely, this isn't, you know, just for how we teach the students, but also so that those teachers who come with their diversity and differences feel welcome and included so that they can bring all of themselves to those students. And I still want to go back to fears because I think uh, many of the fears that people have is what's keeping them from diving in. Like I, I know for me as a facilitator, uh, one of my fears is um, not uh, – appearing competent, mm -hmm. that somebody is going to say or do something, and I'm going to have this moment where I've got to now facilitate the conversation and everybody's looking at me, right. probably mm -hmm. like a principal does when they're facilitating staff conversations or a teacher yeah. does when they're in the classroom. I have that same fear, and this is that moment where I feel like that moment that someone says something or does something that I'm afraid that I won't be able to facilitated a well in well in a way where things are better as a result of my facilitation right. rather than worse I'm thinking to myself I'm gonna have to work hard for my money today and I hope <laughs> I've had my rest and I hope I don't let myself get in the way and I'm really scared in that moment you know what if what if I make things worse what if right. I don't know enough Right, and 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 that's what principals are. They're facilitators of that learning, right? Yeah. And so they certainly can get a little nervous about that. Yeah. What if? What yeah. if I can't get out of that conversation? What if I can't provide the right answer? Right. Or what if I uh, offend people yes, in the absolutely. audience or whatever that might be? Yeah. So it is. It's it is a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about um, what do we do about that? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I talked about it a little bit earlier, but, you know, I, I say, I, you know, I think to myself, okay, so I'm a 50-year-old mm -hmm. white male, mm -hmm. and I'm going to stand in front of my staff or in front of a group of parents, and I'm going to lead conversations about race and bias and equity, and I'm not sure how that's going to go. Yeah. You know, yeah. I haven't walked in the shoes that some of my friends have. Right. Um, I haven't had some of the experiences that some of my friends have. So how do I get up and have a conversation about something that I, that I kind of don't know? Right, absolutely. Right? Yeah, that's a great so, question. So you know, how do I go there? Because I think for a lot, I mean, we'll just be honest. Yeah. When we look at the demographics of principals in our state, a lot of them fit my demographic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if we're shying away from those conversations because of that fear or fears mm -hmm. that are like that, conversations aren't going to happen. Yeah. Right? So what do we? What do we? How do we go there? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think from the from the principal point of view, or whatever that is, I'm in the similar demographic, right? <laughs> you are. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sitting in between two men that are in the similar demographic. It's oh, not dear. similar to me, but that's why but, we're here. That's right. That is why we're here. And I think it's it is difficult. And you talked about fears. A fear of mine was, who am I as the white male yeah, to talk about right. this? But I also think, Ron, who, why wouldn't we? Yeah. You know, because what we are, are leaders, mm -hmm. and we are learners. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it's our job to challenge 
ourselves mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so we can model that right. to say, huh, might not know all of this, but we're going to get started and we're going to get better right. together. Yeah. Right. I imagine that there are a lot of viewers who are not convinced or don't believe that race even matters. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people, when they say, tell me, tell me what I can do. Mm-hmm. What do you want me to do? One thing I want people to do is to become curious, Mm -hmm. to not be convinced that the way in which they see the world or experience the world is the way in which everyone sees or experiences the world, particularly for educators. Like we are educators that um, are, are, are trying to get our students to be curious about the way the world works, about the people that we come across there. It's, it's all about learning. And so, Can we be learners as educators Mm -hmm. too? And so to begin to ask questions so that you understand first why this is important. Mm -hmm. And and so when you say, well, you know, what does that look like? What can we do? It might even be the white person who's who grew up with a cousin who was of a different race where race was never talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. And they take baby steps, which is still a hard thing to do, and go back to that cousin and say, what was it like for you to grow up in a white community, white family members, and we never once talked about it? Um, the, I remember one guy I'd spoken with, had he, he wasn't convinced, and he said, you know, I have a best friend that's Native American, and every year we get together, there's about nine of us, we're all white except for him, and we go on this camping trip together. And I can't remember what organization it was, but I come, he comes, we come back together again one day and he goes, you know, our camping trip happened mm-hmm. and I was nervous and it wasn't comfortable with it, but I brought it up. I brought up race. What has this been like for you? Wow. And our whole conversation was around how he essentially has, has, has left that part of himself behind when he enters into that space. Because what happens is, is a lot of white people, when they do have relationships, they'll assume, cross-cultural relationships, they'll assume that because the person of color isn't talking with them about it, that there must not be an issue. But what we learn as people of color is that they're not comfortable with talking about race. And so I want to have the relationship with you. So I wait until I'm with people that I can have the conversation with. Sometimes it's white people, but a lot of times it's people who look like me. Mm -hmm. So we're having the conversation here, you know, and you walk away saying, wow, that was great. And I walk away speaking the truth. You think we're best friends, which we are maybe in some way, but not in the way in which we could be good friends if we could talk about my reality. So once, you know, I don't, I I always say simple or easy lightly, but one thing is, is just start being curious, you know, um, and then, and then for those who uh, do understand, but are in this place of kind of conscious incompetence, I understand that race matters. I believe that it matters. Mm -hmm. Uh, Take the initiative to grow and learn, right? Access all the tools and resources that are out there for you. Yep. Get hungry and excited uh, around learning and then begin to look at the world through the lens of what it is that you're taking in so that you can test those theories. Right. And then baby steps, right? Like don't be a principal standing up in front of a room and you found some lesson and now you're going to go and, and and then try to teach that to your you know, to your staff, first, maybe just start with my own story. Right. Right. Like my own story. I, as a white person, I might say, or as a multiracial person, I'll say, I start out with, I was taught, you know, that, um, or I, I believe that because I come from such a diverse family that I didn't have biases or stereotypes. Mm -hmm. My brother's gay. My mom's white. My brothers and sisters are white. My stepmother's from Thailand. All these things became proof of my truth that I didn't have work to do. And that might be where I start with with my staff, with Mm -hmm. what I do know, what I have learned, that personal work that I've done. You don't have to start with, well, let me do some, you know, difficult activity Right, kind of thing. Right. Let's just start with our truths and the stories that we've told ourselves. Yep. And it's, it's, I don't think 
that it does anybody any good to say, oh, and take this now and do this with your students. Right. Right. Because the learning has to happen first with the adults in the, in the building. Right. And the adults in the organization. And so as, as our district, as our institution, whatever that is, here's what the adults are learning. Yeah. Right. That will get right. down to students. Yeah. Right. But until we can address that, I think, as adults, the teachers, the principals, right. the, all of that, I, I think that's the place buildings right. have to start. And what it, and what am I saying? I, you know, I'm an interrupter, but what am I saying? <laughs> what are we saying? That the learning starts with the conversation. Yeah. yeah. Right? If we don't start with practicing and just having the conversation, everything else becomes what you had talked about earlier, this kind of checkbox. We wait for this training to come. We then check this box that we did yeah. this cha- yeah. training versus if I can learn how to have these conversations then I can then begin to think about the experiences that my students are having or that my staff are having and how might then I show up differently right. with them. So, you know, it's a, going back to that idea that it's a journey and it's also a continuum, right? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, some people are way over here where I haven't even started to think about it and I don't know if I want to, right? Mm-hmm. right. All the way to people who, this is what I do all the time, I right. love it and I'm great and comfortable with it. Been yes. waiting for y'all to catch up. Yeah, yeah, it, it, <laughs> you know, but it's, yeah. It, it's that. Yeah. And so to understand that the people are gonna start in different spaces and the journey's gonna go from there. Just like right. with our students in the classroom, everybody's coming to us with their own set of experience from different places, whether it's math or reading or mm-hmm. behavior, whatever it is, that's that's human being, yes. yeah. right? So, you know, to be able to to start to build that system, that structure in our districts mm-hmm. where we're brave enough, aware enough to find out where we are on this continuum and to start the journey. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But Jack, I know that you guys have done some work around that in Tumwater. Yeah, Can yeah. You we talk have a little bit. I mean, tell me about that. Sure, you bet. So in Tumwater, it was probably three years ago when um, we invited Caprice to do one of our summer PD sessions. And that PD session was basically, hey, can you talk about some cultural competency in the classroom? And um, that then was so well received Mm -hmm. that we invited Caprice to do a keynote at our summer PD sessions. Mm -hmm. We call that Tumwater University. Mm -hmm. And so in that keynote with that time, we also then said, hey, Caprice, would you also come the year at these certain dates and talk to our teacher leaders? We have a group that comes together uh, every six, eight weeks, representative from every building, administrators and some teacher leaders to go over learning curriculum, various things. So Capri said, sure. So in my thinking as the program administrator, moving from the principalship to the program administrator, I still was in principal pace. Mm -hmm. We'll get Caprice, we'll have the training, that training will go out to the buildings, we'll be done. Literally, yeah. I pr- think I had a legal pad yeah. with a box to check. I think yeah. I did. So like a checklist. Get the cure. I, I, <laughs> we're we're going to be great, right? And I remember that um, after the keynote was really well received, Caprice was able to stay for another session. And then, and then here she came to uh, back when the school year had started. And I remember vividly sharing Caprice my idea. This is how this will go. You will teach, we will learn, and thank you. Uh, that, that, you know, it's been really nice knowing you. Yeah. And she said, oh, oh, we're going to slow this down. Yeah. And I, I don't think any principal likes to hear we're going to slow this down. Yeah. Um, and so what happened was that made me start to think. And the learning that Caprice started to help our student leaders with everybody in the room started realizing, oh, this isn't a take back to our staff this Friday. Mm -hmm. We don't even know how to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And everything just shifted for our district. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of conversations as district leadership teams, as principals, as teacher leaders. Wow, we don't know what we don't know. We are not ready to um, even really address this sincerely and authentically ourselves until we have some more work. So we backed up, we slowed this way down, um, we took the year to really try and get comfortable in, in who that group was that mm-hmm. was experiencing some more time with Caprice and some activities taking us through. Um, and then we realized, wow, that, that's, that was, um, this is, this is a journey. Yeah. And, and Caprice was very clear with our district, this is a journey. 
Um, I'm not gonna come in and just provide some little trainings and expect that it's all right. gonna be okay. Right. That, um, and she helped guide us in that this would be a lot more damaging if we did it that way mm -hmm. than we would than we than we ever would have thought right so we're in now year three mm -hmm. of working with caprice mm -hmm. and we just got done actually yeah. this week um we are in a train the trainer type of model mm -hmm. taking this very slowly yeah. principals hand selected teachers that would help do this work at their building mm -hmm. um and so we had some great people in the room right. that were ready to learn how to become facilitators right. not are they the experts yet nope how do we facilitate these hard conversations or activities or yeah. um, conversations in the staff lounge or whatever that is? Yeah. And so those two full days with these trainer of trainers talking about facilitation and what does this mean and what happens if, what if you do offend and how, how do you work around that? I'm, I'm very curious mm -hmm. as when these activities start heading back into our buildings, what the feedback will be. Yeah, because today they're facilitating. They're doing it today. They're doing it today. Yeah. And by the way, Jack, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you have other consultants. It's not just myself that's coming in. You've got kind of a couple of other consultants that are working with board, working superintendent. Like oh, there's, yeah. there's a whole yeah. lot of different things going on. It's not this kind of reliant upon, well, we're going to bring Caprice in and she's going to do other, you're thinking right. about it in multiple ways. And um, um, uh, my experience of you is that you're also uh, beginning to take this role of being a leader around this as well. Like by, you know, no, I didn't tell you this is the way you need to do it. You have said, okay, this is the way, based on what Caprice is sharing with us, this is the way that I think it would work best for our district. Right. And I consult with you and say, okay, well, let me give you some advice here. I think that might be moving a little bit too quickly. Right. Think about what might happen if your principals aren't really prepared and then teachers then take that into the classroom and yeah. you know begin to have you imagining things. But really, I'm not the one telling you no. that this is the way it needs to go. And I think that's important for people to understand as they they often do want this cookbook formulaic I don't know what you can do in your classroom with your students it depends on what district you're in how much support do you have from your principal what's your understanding of this work what's your level of comfort who are your students in the classroom I can't tell you what you will do in your building it depends on who you are and where your where your commute your school community is at yeah. nor can I tell you what to do with that parent and that there's there's so much complexity to it there is but if you are willing to begin to take the risk of stepping into something that there are no real answers to. Um, what you will learn from that in the process is, for me, has been just life-changing and, and powerful. And, and I, would, I would say that, that that's exactly right. When we have some ideas from Caprice, ideas from other consultants that we are using, ideas around principal meetings that come out around culture and um, what, are, what is the feeling in our buildings, all of those things that are so important to every leader, mm -hmm. um, it has spurred some really great mm -hmm. mapping for our district of where do we want to be, who do we want to be, mm -hmm. and how are we gonna go about our everybody's learning in that. Right. Yeah. So talk a little bit then about the role of self-awareness mm -hmm. in this, mm -hmm. right? We've, mm -hmm. we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but I think when I think about my own journey, my own awareness, and just that whole where do I start, mm -hmm. piece, you know, one of the things that I hear Kurt talk about all the time in our office is, man, you got to start with yourself. Right. You have to start with your own understanding. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that and and what role does that play when when people out there are saying I'm watching this because I want to know what to do right right it sounds right. like what to do starts with with you absolutely me, right absolutely so what, what is that yeah I think about how so many people in our society are taught to approach race with kind of this like universal approach, like we're all human, you know, we all bleed, right? And I'm like, yes. I don't see color. I don't see, you know, color, yeah. well, the universal is more like we're all human, right. Right? right? And we are all human, right? But that's not, that misses 
out on some other parts of what I am. Yes, I'm human and I'm a woman. Yes, I'm human and I'm multiracial. Yes, I'm human and all of these identities that I hold. In other words, it kind of proposes that everybody has the same need, that res- that, that what respect looks like for you is the same as what it looks like for me. And another common approach that people take is that kind of colorblind approach, that's that individual approach, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, I'm an individual and you're an individual. I'm going to treat you um, based on how you treat me, right? I don't notice race. I mean, of course we do. You know, I notice your gender. I notice the color of your jacket. Of course we do. No, but, but all of those things are a socialized process. Mm-hmm. We are taught not to notice race, that we're a bad person if we do. Look at our history and, and what we've done out of noticing race, what we've done to people. So the pendulum swings in that other direction and we say, well, we're just not gonna notice and we're just gonna treat everybody like human beings, which is good, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And so part of that personal work is looking at how I've been socialized to think that way Mm -hmm. and then what's the harm in it. So I always tell in, in my workshops, I always tell people, you know, what is it that you want me to know what do you think someone wants me to know when they tell me that they don't notice my race well we the audience will come up with things like they want me to know that they're going to treat me fair that they're not going to let my race get in the way that they're not going to be racist towards me in any way and so in other words it comes from a good place Mm -hmm. but what i always say is You know, what I want to know is why can't I be black and you do those things? Mm. Like, why do you have to not see me in order to treat me fairly? Why do you have Mm. to, you know, not notice something that's an important part of who I am? And then what do what messages do children get? And then later, as we become adults, about what it means to be different. Mm -hmm. Right. So we end up some of us end up internalizing that as being an inferior being Mm -hmm. and so while so when you say this question of what can i what can we do um or you know and starting with that personal work just look at what we've been taught see people are doing the same thing that i used to do they will point to someone in their life or multiple people in their life as proof of their truth that they don't have any work to do. You know, my I work with someone who is Asian. I I you know I dated someone who is, and you you know you can fill in the blank. My children are even being a person of color becomes proof that the work is white people's work, and that I don't have any work to do as a person of color. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, we're all being socialized. Now we it may impact us in different ways. How you're taking in racism and our, or bias or what have you, and what that's doing to me may be different things, but I've got some unpacking to do because it is informing how I engage. So starting with ourselves Mm -hmm. is probably not only the most important place to start, it's also the hardest place to start because it means then that I'm acknowledging that the work isn't just about they, those, them out there. Right, right, right. And I'd rather say you're the one with the problem than me. <laughs> and what I find that's fascinating, and you know, you were telling a great story before we turned on the cameras, but I love to watch myself. Like I love to see all the ways in which I find myself surprised, right? I always say surprise is the emotion that you feel where you realize that you have a stereotype. I mean, this is just one mm. example. I, I say, you know, can I speak to the person in charge? And I'm not thinking anything about this until the person in charge comes out. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, I didn't realize that the person in charge might be Muslim or in a wheelchair or, and I don't have that surprise when it's a white man that comes out Mm -hmm. because I've been taught that white men are the people in charge. And so just these moments where I realize, wow, there's another way in which I've been taught that people who look like me aren't in these types of roles. Right. That, you know, that's powerful. I, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I was raised in a family, great parents that, um, really emphasized that we don't talk about those things because it's impolite. Absolutely. And it, and like yes. you said, it came yes. from a good place, yeah. but I was probably in my early to mid forties before it even started to occur to me that, by not talking about it because it would be impolite is impolite, right? right? right you know, right. so to come to that realization that these conversations need to happen, um, they should be happening between myself and my staff and my parent community and my students right. because 
that's how we start to understand each other. That's Absolutely. how we start to learn about our own biases. Okay. Um, and really understand how that impacts, you know, from a principal perspective, mm. how does not talking about that impact my leadership? Right, right. And whose interests are being served when when it's not being talked yeah. about? It's not it's not people of color. It's not people with disabilities. It's not um, people with different, you know, religious or beliefs, right? It's the person of the privileged group, right? And I know privilege is a triggered word, and we can talk about that well, during we'll there well, another, another, yeah. another. That's yeah. a whole another, you know, a whole another day. Right. Right. But the point is, is it, it serves the person who is left feeling comfortable by not having to engage in the or enter into these spaces where they've never explored before. So let's say I'm meeting your pre, you know, 40 year old self and I've known my whole life that race matters, that yeah. my race matters. And then you're coming like, hey, it's just all about we're all human and we don't notice race. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? Don't, do you know what happened to me in the store the other day? Right. Do you know the fear I had when my husband was driving through the mountains or whatever yeah, it but is? I don't do that, but, so it's not a thing, right, right? Right, so, right, So now I can't really talk to you because we're coming from very different places. And the message that I get as a person of color is make Ron feel comfortable being around me. Mm -hmm. And to make Ron feel comfortable being around me, that means that I don't talk about my truth, particularly if you're my boss, particularly if it's not the culture of, of the organization I'm in. I learn that and then I go home feeling exhausted of how much I've had to leave myself behind. You had talked about you you didn't realize that it was impolite and, until for a while, or, or yeah. you had that moment when you realized, oh, by me not addressing this, it's it's not the way I should be doing that. I, I remember as like fifth or sixth year into my principalship when that realization came to me about how much of these families I was missing. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. not acknowledging the family. Yeah. I was acknowledging families in our right. building. Right. We were, you know, what what do we what does every principal want? Oh, everybody's right. welcome. Everyone's we were not in our building acknowledging families of color. Right. We did not have a good understanding of their cultural heritage. We did not have an understanding of what may or may not be offensive to them. Um, and it was when that realization started for me when I really started having conversations with our staff about what are we doing? What do we know? What right. do we not know? And that didn't gain a lot of traction um, in our building because I didn't know how to do that. Right, right, and right. so having the conversations was one thing, but not I, I just didn't know what to do with that because right, right. I think I didn't know what to do with me. Right, right. Um, and so that, that's been a journey for me, but I think it, it's really important that every building, you said um, every district's gonna say, preparing students for a global right, economy right, or right. whatever that is. Every boardroom, in the every boardroom right, yeah. talks about that. But we also say, we all have a very welcoming environment. Right, right, That's right. gonna be on some type of school improvement plan. We have a welcoming environment. Um, and my question is, did we? Right. Did we really, right. and who was it welcoming right. to? So when I think about what you're saying and this question that you had asked and we were talking about awareness and now you're bringing in this knowledge, like this knowledge of the families that you're serving. Right. So I know one cultural norm that our society in general operates under, um, particularly white culture, is that when someone is being, when a child is being disciplined in, in a way, a way that that child shows that they're listening, that they hear you, that they are being respectful of you is to look at you when you're talking to them, right? right? Look at me when I'm talking to you. And maybe a teacher isn't saying that, maybe a principal isn't saying that, but they might be thinking that because that's, the cultural norm that they're operating under so that when that student doesn't, they may then label that child as being defiant, resistant, um, disrespectful. disrespectful, absolutely. Not having knowledge that maybe that child's culture, um, that in that child's culture, not looking at you when you're disciplining um, them, that that's what's respectful, mm -hmm. right? But if I don't have knowledge of the cultures that I'm serving and I'm not aware that this is my cultural norm that I'm operating on under, then how will I then effectively engage that student in that moment? Our cultures are going to clash. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Mm -hmm. And and this is where we end up seeing more kids of color, for example, in um in dis you know, in, in facing disciplinary action. Yeah. Right. As one as one example of how this plays out and why it's important right. that we do some personal work. And then we also make value statements around our cultural norms. So we believe, we all believe our way is the right way. If we didn't believe our way was the right way, we wouldn't do it that way. Mm -hmm. So then we come face to face with these other cultures and then we believe that those cultures should change the way that they do things to more align with our cultures. And when I'm saying all oh, our culture, I'm meaning white culture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you hear things like, you know, I remember being in a district where a bus driver had um, disciplined a child telling, it was an elementary school child, that they should not be speaking Spanish on the bus, right? That's around a belief around like, this is America, you know, kind of speak English so we don't see the ways in which our, our, our um, val pushing our values and beliefs, not understanding what might be going on for someone else then takes precedence. Yeah. And now the environment is no longer welcoming. Right. It's no longer inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting you talk about that. I think about my time as a elementary principal and, you know, our primary kids, our, you know, our preschoolers, our kindergartners are often the ones that, you know, they're learning how to assimilate just to school in general. Right. 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 But you have kids that are coming through our doors who spend, 17, 18 hours a day in their cultural environment. And then they walk through the door of the school and we expect them to assimilate to what's going on in, as, as you, you rightfully termed it, mm. in a school that operates on white culture. You raise yep. your hand, you don't blurt out, you sit down, you don't get up and go get a toy just because you see it. Right. But in their family, that might be how you survive. At the dinner table, we don't take turns talking. Right. We talk louder, we talk right. over, and we listen to conversations while they cross. Right. That's my normal. Right. And it, I might be 15, 16 years old, and that's still how we do things at home. Yes. And, you know, Anthony Muhammad, one of my favorite authors, talks about, you know, we're trying to teach kids how to code switch. Right. 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 To get into yes. to, so that yeah. they can assimilate what we do. And I, I think where we're missing the boat is we're trying to force kids to do that. Right. But we're not going to, to where they are to seek a better understanding. And, and there's our disconnect. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a great story around this. So my son's in first grade <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've been teaching, you know, when you're in the classroom and you raise your hand and this is what respect means. Now we can interrupt and, you know, tell story, get really excited and energized or what have you in the home, but I'm teaching him, here's how you behave sure. when you're in the classroom. Ready. Now at this school, it was a predominantly um, Asian and, and African American student population, but predominantly white teachers. I walk into the classroom and it's reading time. So they're all on the carpet right, and the teacher is reading a book, and the kids are having a great time with the story. They're shouting out, you know, they're, you know, doing, they're just being them, they're enjoying that moment, and here's my son, the only kid, who's raising his hand, <laughs> waiting to get called on, you know, and I'm like, how do I explain this to him that there are, and I, and I, and I do wish that more teachers would do this, which is to explain to kids. It's not that, that, that we don't have to learn that you can't always interrupt. But, but just to, to help kids understand, these are the moments where it's important that you, you engage in this way. So when you're, when you're talking in your groups, it's okay if you get up and down and come to me back and forth as you're all doing, working on projects in different areas. There you don't have to, like we can have that high energy level and everybody's engaged and there's noise. But when I'm maybe teaching a lesson, and I want to be able to get different thoughts in the room and get to jump. Then I want you to raise your hand so that I can think about who I'm going to call on and who hasn't had a chance to be heard. I mean, I'm making this up as I'm as I'm as I'm speaking, but kids have to figure out what the rules are, yes. and it's usually a long time before they get it. <laughs> and many times, the teachers aren't aren't really creating those rules where the learning has different styles. Yeah. It usually is there is one way in which we learn. I teach and whatever it is that we're doing, here's how you participate. You participate by, so I never get to bring my energy, my mm -hmm. excitement, um, who I am into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And how exhausting for those kids. Yeah. I mean, if, if that's your world on the weekends and in the evenings right. and on breaks, 
and then you come back to right. an environment where you're trying to push yourself into that new set of rules right. and new set of expectations. And of course, we need to learn right. that skill because that's that's the workplace in the world we're getting ready to live in. Right, right. But it's got to be exhausting right. for kids to have to check who they are at the door, yeah. walk through it and attend. And then we wonder why they get booted. Right. Because you can only rein that in for so long right, right. In, until you start to really learn the rules. Right, right. And maybe we need to start rethinking what are the rules and right. how are we teach them. Right, and are they the right rules? Like yeah. when I worked at African American Academy, uh, so predominantly black school, K-8, uh, the lunch lady was a white woman. And she kept complaining, you know, over and over again that the kids were being unruly. And we're trying to mm. help them, her understand, if you actually look at what the kids are doing, they're not fighting, they're not having conflict, like this is their time to let loose, like really look at what is going, like actually focus in and look and see what are the kids doing, they're having fun. Mm -hmm. Can the lunchtime be? Do they have to still stand in line? Do they st do they have to still behave and act in a way that we think is the right way? As long as no one is being hurt, as long as they're not doing anything dangerous, as long as they're like they've been in the classroom all day long. Yeah, yeah. I can't be in a room all day long and not, you know, let out some of that, yeah. you know, yeah. energy. We're adults. That's right. Yeah. You know, this is great stuff. It's, um, yeah, I, I'm excited to be able to just, you know, have this conversation. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate the, the, the map we're starting to draw out here, the mm -hmm. road we're taking. Um, you know, being able to partner with WASA and WASDA and OSPI. I mean, people are starting to really dial in on the right work. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what, what's this journey going to look like? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to have these conversations. Um, you know, it's, and I'm excited, um, you know, for our audience, we're, we're planning multiple conversations in a, in a kind of a series around this, around just how do I lead this? And, you know, I'm looking forward to our next conversation. We talked about it earlier. I mean, um, <laughs> you, I've shared my story with you about privilege and how that used to make me bristle a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if I can't understand that, mm -hmm. um, how do I start to navigate it and be better for kids and better for other people? Right. Right. So, um, I, I have one thought that as just as you're closing and I, I will let you do the closing, no, but I, I do get so excited <laughs> with this, but I think about, as you talked about who you were, you know, pre 40 mm -hmm. and, and then I think about where you are now and, um, I, if, if I was to ask, you know, where was, you know, this organization five years ago, 10 no. years ago, 15 years ago, where was I, mm -hmm. you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, and thinking about what members in the audience have to look forward to. And my, my son, um, he had said that this work is, people will often approach this work like, um, like wanting to have that fit body, right? Like I want that body in the magazine, right? Mm -hmm. But we actually don't want to go to the gym. I know I don't. Right. We don't <laughs> want to, you know, do that, eat healthy. We don't want to do all the things that not, it won't get you there overnight. Right. But it's just, okay, I'm not going to eat this thing today. And that gradually that as we then look back, it's like, wow, here we are. Yeah. And that's the work. That's the journey, not the event, not the one day I didn't eat that, that, yeah. that meal. How come I haven't lost all this weight? Right, How come right. I don't have those muscles bulging or whatever it is that I want that? Yeah, it's tiring. And just when I think everything is okay, you know, I spend some time relaxing and not taking care of myself. And the next thing I know, yeah. I'm unhealthy again. And so this constant need to just be mindful of how we show up in the world, what's going on in our heads, what were we taught, practicing, yeah. um, getting in those uncomfortable places. It's not always easy. I would rather have the peach cobbler, you know, yeah, than, yeah, yeah. The, than the salad, you know, or whatever it is. And not probably a good comparison, no. but I want the dessert <laughs> first. Right? I want the dessert first. But um, yeah, I just I want yeah. it to be easy. Yeah. Well, and that's that's why I'm excited about this because I mean you, you I like that analogy because it it it's a workout. Yeah. yeah and we're going to have to work hard, and things are going to it's going to be uncomfortable. There's days you're not going to want to get up and do this. Yeah. Um, but but it's the necessary steps that we're going to take as a profession. Yeah. As, a, as an association and, and maybe even more importantly, as 
we start to understand who we are in in this big world mm -hmm. and what our place is in it. Yeah, you know. So you know, I'm I'm looking forward to the conversations, and thank you guys for being with us. Oh, today. I'm really encouraged awesome. about this. Yeah. I'm really thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. See you guys next time. Yeah.